Welcome to the Asian Women of Power podcast, where your host, Kim Chi Chow, shares tips, tools, insights, and strategies on how you too can create the life you love with freedom, power, and choice. Kim Chi will show you how to break free of your cultural boundaries and boldly live the life of your dreams. If you are ready to transform your life, please go to www.asianwomenofpowerquiz.com and take the quiz. You may qualify for a free discovery session with Kim Chi. And now, here's your host, Kim Chi Chow. Today, more women are stepping up to start their own businesses. Having a good idea for a product or a service is not enough. You need to have the skills and knowledge about running, maintaining, and growing your business. The key for longevity of any business is the system. This is a special sauce that the franchise model is offering. Our special guest for today is Nancy Williams. Nancy is an expert in helping business owners select the right type of franchise for anyone who's interested in that business model. So please help me welcome Nancy Williams. Hello, Kim Chi. Hello, listeners. Thank you for having me today. You're welcome. We're glad that you're here. So, Nancy, what are some memories from your childhood that really stood out for you? Uh, so, there's a, several things I can think of, but, um, you know, just giving you a little bit of background, uh, you know, I was an Afri- African-American family, two-parent household. Uh, my mom was a stay-at-home mom, so my father was the only one working uh, full-time, and um, we grew up in a, in a suburb of uh, a town, a suburb of Los Angeles, and it was predominantly white and Asian, and so, you know, I didn't see a lot of faces that looked like myself. Um, um, you know, I'd certainly my classmates, but not a lot of role ma- models, maybe a few teachers. Uh, but um, so what brings that, what, what that brings me to is my father is a Vietnam vet and he is a voracious reader. So he loves history. He specifically loves African-American history. So in our home, we had a lot of information um, at our fingertips about our culture and history and sort of the struggles that we had been through and the things that we had achieved uh, in spite of all that. So I received, um, and so, you know, he grew up at a time where it wasn't necessarily um, okay to be so proud of being African-American. He faced challenges in both um, his uh, military and non-military life. Um, so he had a lot to share with, with myself and my sister. And so I kind of gobbled that up and it gave me a very um, grounded sense of self and pride that I may not have had without him because again, there wasn't a lot of that around, um, you know, in, in, in the local area that I was in. So I think that that, um, that certainly is something I remember from childhood because it is, it is absolutely stuck with me today. So, you know, in addition to that, when I reflect on it, I would say my other, uh, the other biggest thing that I take from childhood is about um, working. So as I mentioned, my, my mom was a stay-at-home mom, so we were on a um, one salary income for the household. Um, and it was, you know, basics only. So if you wanted something above and beyond the basics of food and shelter and, you know, just making sure you had clothes and things for school, you had to get it on your own. So um, we really started working at the age of 13. And uh, we worked, uh, our first job was at, in the local parks and recreation center. We were doing scorekeeping for both um, youth and adult sports. And so we, you know, we were able to take that and then understand how important and special money could be if you used it in the right way. And so we learned that from very early on. So from um, anything from from sports, you know, sports keeping, number keeping, to Baskin Robbins, to the local amusement park, uh, you know, to to in a real estate office as we grew up. So there was there was ample opportunity for us to learn how to earn money, learn about taxes, learn about saving, and what to do with it. So I think again, um, that would be a, a, one of the other real standout things from my childhood was, uh, you know, our, our parents demanding that if we wanted something, we really had to work for it. 
And I really can't remember going for more than a couple of weeks since the age of 13 and not having a job or a business. So how many siblings do you have? I have one. I have an older sibling. We're pretty close together. She's 17 months older than I am. So uh, relatively small family. You say 17? She's 17 months. Months. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So like yeah. almost two years old. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Okay. So pretty close. Wow. That is a very, very, um, I think your parents has established a strong foundation for you. Yes. Right. As a reader, right? He's right. Uh, as a reader, he learned about history and he, you know, we do, uh, we do by watching the parent, what the parent does, right? So you probably also uh, become a, a reader, right? Because you see your parent, your father read all the time exactly. and then you learn the skills of um, managing or create money <laughs> from Correct. That young, very young uh, age. That is wonderful. Not yes. many of us are fortunate to have that, uh, that two things. Yes, and I, I learned that. I've learned that so much, especially doing what I do now, how few people know and understand and have a good foundation for that. Um, and even, you know, as, as good as my parents were at it, you know, I noticed some things that would have been great had they shared um, because they were property owners that, you know, we owned our primary home, but they were also investment property owners. Um, but I think, you know, my, my, my parents from an older generation, so that line between what you share with children and, and what you don't is, is, is a little bit more traditional for them and getting into things like, you know, what we pay on a mortgage and how you get them. I, I think that, you know, didn't happen like it should. So, uh, so as well as they did, you know, there's still such opportunity to share with uh, young people uh, what they're going to be facing so that they understand and prepare for it early on. So give me an example, like, like what things that, they did not share that you wish that they share early I on. wish I wish they would have talked a lot more about credit and FICO scores and credit cards and how to use them wisely and how they can help you and then at the same time how they hurt you and and ways to navigate through that when it's okay to borrow when it's not you know those sorts of things I, you know I think it, it was easy for them to just say don't ever borrow any money <laughs> which sounds great but when you're a student and they're throwing credit cards at you and you know you, you don't have a lot of wiggle room you need to understand why and that that no is just not enough I think so I would say you know things around I don't ever recall my parents talking to me about credit cards or FICO scores. It's something that they didn't use a lot of credit cards. They may have had one, so they probably thought didn't think much of it. Um, but but you know things like FICO scores and what you need to purchase property. They you know were very savvy and you know they had owned several pieces of property, but they just never really had that conversation. Very good point. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Absolutely, my pleasure. Yeah. So what has led you to become a franchise broker and why do you want to focus on serving minority women? So uh, I had a, um, a great career in corporate America in the telecommunications world for 14 years. I learned more than I could have ever imagined. I had an incredible staff. I had some incredible um, uh, managers and teachers and mentors. So I, I, you know, there's, I can't say anything bad about uh, my experience in corporate telecommunications. Um, but after 14 years, uh, it was, it was, there was a lot of changes going on and I decided it's time to take advantage of, of the opportunity to leave with a, uh, on a high note, um, with a nice severance package and, and understand and explore my options. So that led me to um, prior, you know, in my early years, I had other businesses. So at, you know, one, at, at some point in college, I had a nonprofit organization where we worked with inner city kids on the weekends and took them to university campuses to expose them to that. And then after I got out of college, I, I went into a, a record, a private um, record label deal with a friend of mine that I had worked with. And so I did that for a few years. And then I eventually got into telecom. So, um, uh, so 14, you know, after 14 years, I felt I had enough experience to go off and, and start another business that should I choose. And I wasn't sure what that was going to be, but I, I liked the concept of franchising. I had known, you know, previous franchise owners. Um, I, coming from a corporate background, um, 
appreciate having a support system already set up behind you, someone that can teach you lessons learned and keep you on that path that, you know, to, to success. So I knew I wanted that. And so I started my search for a franchise that might work best for me. And uh, I wasn't even familiar with the concept of franchise consulting. But in your search, if anyone's ever done a search, that you will get pop-ups that say, would you like to speak to a certified franchise consultant? And that's what I did. And, you know, as they say, the rest is history. Uh, for me, the decision to embark on this um, business was and after speaking with a lot of the uh, franchise consultants to validate the business, I decided, um, yeah, I knew that there was very few women doing it because I think I only was able to validate with one or two women. And then um, second of all, um, there was even fewer minorities. So I didn't speak to a single minority um, and certainly not a minority woman, woman um, in validation. So I thought, this is my niche. This is what I'm here for. I have the history um, behind me, um, you know, proud to be an African-American businesswoman and I can bring that to the table. Um, to my own community and other communities that can relate to, um, to, to the experience. And that's exactly why um, I decided to go, you know, really focus in on women and minorities. And truth be told, uh, a lot of times um, minority groups will not get into certain things because they don't feel comfortable. They don't have someone to usher them in uh, to the business, uh, you know, the, the type of business they're looking for. So, you know, I, I thought I could be that advocate. I could be that ambassador for them. And I felt, you know, that I was trustworthy enough to be able to do that. I was comfortable explaining it, comfortable um, from, a, um, from a former management director perspective that I could bring people along. And, and ever, I haven't looked back since. It's something that I really love to do. Wow, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, you see the opportunity to serve so, and you step up. Exactly. Con Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So let's say I want to own a business. Yes. It could be a franchise or business, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that generate about $10,000 a month of sure. income. But I don't know what type of business that I want that fit me. Sure. So guide me through the process of identifying the right franchise for me. Sure. So, uh, you know, while, while revenues and incomes are one piece of criteria, we use so many others that, that I have to tell you, oftentimes um, the amount of revenue uh, starts to slip down on the list as people explore the various opportunities. Um, some may find that the opportunities that have the largest revenues are ones they're just absolutely not interested in or don't think they would do well in. So again, we do take into account uh, the individual's um, interest in, in, in revenue, um, but you know, we take it much further. So if, when a client comes to me, I will start off with several things. I'll do exactly what you know, we did at the, top of the, at the top of the podcast, which is I need to understand who they are, what their background is, why they're looking for a change, uh, what, you know, what things they like, what things they don't like, what do they have a passion for, what do they feel they're good at, what have other people told them that they're good at. So we go through a series of questions to evaluate that. I will also send them a written um, business personality um, survey um, questionnaire that will help you work through that and it sheds light on um, what type of personality you have or type of business would might be really good for you. Mm -hmm. And then um, it, it, for me, it also provides insight as to um, your level of skill set and what types of franchises, not just the category or the sector, but size. Uh, you know, if, if you want to be, you know, it, it doesn't make sense for you to build an empire or, or should you just be an owner operator? So the, the personality, uh, business personality questionnaire gives a lot of good insight. So that's another tool that we'll use. Um, and then once, you know, once I learn a lot more about you, you know, there's some back and forth and we settle in on, on what your, um, what you can afford to invest in. And, and when we look at that number, we look at two, look at it in two ways. We look at it from how much cash or capital do you have on hand and how much are you going to be able to secure in an SBA loan? So, um, you know, those are two different things you need to look at, but certainly the capital or cash that you have is one of the, um, first drivers of what categories we can actually look at.
So, mm-hmm. so is it like um, like buying an, a house that you need at least like 20% down minimum or something like that, right? Yeah, it's a little bit more in business. So um, with the SBA currently, uh, you would need somewhere between 25% and 30% mm-hmm. uh, and to secure the loan and they will fund the rest. You would need a credit score of 680 or above. And uh, the nice thing about most franchises is that they are already... Uh, registered with the SBA in their loan program. So they've gone through some pre-registration steps to show that they're a franchise that's valid, uh, that has business cases and, you know, that need, that can be submitted along with the loan and certain paperwork that has to go along with that. Mm-hmm. So besides SBA, uh, is there any other channel that, um, you know, um, the prospect of the franchise franchisee can can go to sure so um so what we do a lot of um my call myself and my colleagues we go to what we consider aggregators of funding so uh, if you are a client of mine i would um, do an introduction to one of the aggregators the big aggregators that i work with across the country and set you up with a free consultation and basically they'll walk you through all levels of funding Um, There are others outside of SBA, and they'll walk you through all of those programs. But outside of that, just from a community perspective, certainly, there are a lot of local grants that are provided that, you know, for those that are diligent enough and and know, you know, where to look, and I can certainly direct them in that way. But there are local grants. um, There are um, other funding sources. There's partnerships that you can look into entering. And then, um, of course, you know, what's what's helped a lot of people these days, some kind of, some sort of crowdfunding, right? So you're going to want to offer um, something in exchange for investment into your new business. So those are just some of the various options that a, that an aspiring entrepreneur has. Whoa. <laughs> I, now I understand why do you say it is a daunting task? It is absolutely. Daunting. Oh my God. It's just too much, too, too many ends that I have to untangle, right? It, it, it is. And yeah. for, for most people, you know, it's, it's not knowing what you don't know and trying to pull all that together. So working with someone like myself, um, we know all of the steps. We've been trained. We've been certified. Uh, we know who to go to if we don't know an answer. We have um, networks of partnerships that can help you with legal issues, as I said, funding issues. So, you know, we have it at our fingertips. So rather than, you know, trying to find it all out yourself, it's just better to work with someone that's a, an expert in the field. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. When, let's say, I'm just using an example, okay? Let's say I want, I want a, a burger chain. Sure. <laughs> That's the easiest one. Yeah. A burger chain or the chicken, chicken rice chain, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Sure. So what are the most important criteria for me to consider when I compare one brand versus the other brand in the same industry? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So I would say in the same industry, you're going to be looking at basics such as cost. And when I say cost, I don't just mean the cost to enter the business, but I mean the royalties and the ad fees that you have to pay once the business is up and running. That's important to to take a look at those and make sure that um, you're comfortable with what that is. So in comparison to each other. Um, But I would also say that um, industry experience uh, can be another way to look at them, um, two, two, two or three brands that are the same. So let's just say senior care or something like that. Um, some people are comfortable with what we call emerging brands. So emerging brands are brands that have under a hundred units. And some people are, are fine with, um, some people are fine with taking what they consider more of a risk. So, so statistics show that brands that have over a hundred units tend to do much better off long-term. So if they've hit that milestone of a hundred, then, you know, it, they're, they're looking pretty good in the future future in terms of, of, of how well. What do you mean by unit? So a hundred franchisees. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So I, yeah, I would say, you know, the number might be a little off because there could be multiple unit owners. Right. Um, so that's why when we say a hundred units, it could be a hundred franchisees, but it could be also a hundred physical locations. 
So, you know, it just depends on the type of business that we're looking at, but um, 100 is typically a, a good milestone there. So you have some people that want experienced businesses over 100, um, you know, that are very stable. They can, you know, contact a lot of people and find out. Other people are okay with um, what we consider emerging brands. So maybe a newer food on the food uh, category that's on the scene, right? Um, they they want to get in early. They're early adopters. They think it's going to take off. And so they're more comfortable with something that's new and maybe a little bit less established. So that's another criteria that a lot of people look at to say, am I comfortable with this, am, am I not? Um, so I would say that. I would also say um, um, industry differentiators. So um, what is it about each of those brands that you're looking at that say that, you know, create a differentiator for them in that space? So again, I'll go back to senior care because that's one that, you know, a lot of senior care businesses give the same services. But when you start really looking um, at the details of how they give those services, or maybe they do, maybe there's a brand that doesn't just do seniors, maybe they do disabled, maybe they do people that have just been, you know, released from the hospital and they need, you know, home care for a little while so those are the things that you want to look for in various brands on what's differentiating them from each other so those are some key key things to look for for sure mm -hmm. so do they um, does the franchisor require the the franchisee to run to own and run the the franchise once they they bought it Sure. So the, uh, again, another really good question. It depends on the franchise. So let's stick with senior care for a minute because we're already here. So most senior care companies, they want owner operated. And that is because that is a very sensitive um, hands-on business that um, is involving lives and they don't want just you know someone that's farming out, you know, all of that work and not being hands-on because it is a very, um, sensitive business, you know, to say the least, emotional business, and, and they prefer that. But you brought up burger chains, chicken chains, that's usually the case. Uh, you get a lot of multi-unit owners who have the capital to hire a operations manager, um, either to oversee a couple of locations or one at each location, and uh, they're just in a totally bit different business. It's not really about food for them or um, cleaning, you know, cleaning supplies. It's, it's about building an empire of a business and then hiring the right people to, to run it. So again, it depends on the model, uh, the sector, and then the uh, available capital that you have to actually create the, the business. Mm -hmm. So do I have to move if I want to own a franchise that has not been, you know, registered in my state or in my town yet? <laughs> yes, you would have to move if the if the franchise has not been registered in your state. Um, th they're just not allowed to to, um, to to practice there. There's just there's no option there to uh, to be a business. So you would either have to wait um, until it gets there. A lot of times, you know, for working with um, you know a, a franchise broker or consultant, they can call the franchisor and ask, you know, either when are they going to be registered or actually. I have a great client, I would like you to register in the state. We also have that influence over um, franchisors all the time that may be just regional, but they don't think they have enough interest to register, say, in California. So we work together and they will, you know, if we have a viable candidate, we can certainly ask them to register and, and be okay. So, so in terms of moving, I wouldn't recommend that. It's interesting because um, Texas is the top franchising state in the country. And it makes sense. So it's a lower cost of living. They've got some tax breaks. They, you know, lots of space, lots of suburbs that are, you know, cropping up. So it makes sense that franchises are there. And I do get calls from clients saying, I'm going to, you know, I think I'm going to, I should move to, <laughs> to Texas uh, so I can open a franchise. And because it's not as expensive as it would be, say, in California or New York. Um, so, yes, yeah, so of, of course you could move. And I, I have worked with people that, that, that are in transit and are asking me to find them a franchise in another state, which is no problem. Uh, but a lot of times, uh, franchisors really want people that are in the community, know the community, and have community relationships, because that's what's going to build your business. So if you move to some place where you're not really familiar, you don't have that network of people, it, it can be a little bit risky in terms of success. So again, depends on the brand. So besides, besides the uh, operation 
and human resource management and things like that. Does the franchisor educate us or teach us on how to build community, you know, how to enroll the community to come and support our business once the, the franchise uh, open? Yes, love that question. Um, that's one of the reasons that I do love franchises. And I don't want I mean, I don't want to say all franchises are excellent at this, but the ones that I work with, I've been amazed at how hands on they have been with my clients in terms of helping them to open the business and just what you do after that and how you connect with the community. Um, so, so, you're, so the first part of your question in terms of training, I love franchises for the fact that they are, they fully train you on the business. And I don't mean just, you know, how to flip a burger or anything like that. We're talking the financials, profit and loss statements, things like that, that are going to help you be a good business owner, no matter what sector you're in. So all of that. And then of course, on how to run that specific business. And then um, there's a, the full aspect of marketing that is huge. And another nice thing about franchises is most franchises have a complete database that the franchise franchisee owners can use and leverage um, that's marketing tools local marketing tools flyers discount on um, printing um, how to how to build a Facebook site for your business how to you know go use Twitter to, to leverage um, you know that relationship in order to grow your business so it's a full set of that and a lot of them even if they don't have that um, that talent in-house, um, they will um, contract a third party. Uh, it could be it could be another um, uh, coaching franchise or something like that that comes in and works with their franchisees to help them become uh, really great owners. So yes, there's a lot of that that goes on. And the, and as I said, the the really good franchisors they um, have a complete packet and some world class information uh, that helps people learn how to run the business. So. Why do you think it's easier to choose the wrong franchise than the right one, even though we have so much resources available on internet? Yes, so I would say because a lot of times people think they want one thing, and then when they start to learn about it, they realize that that's not really what they want. And our favorite example um, is, is using something like Subway. And while I love Subway, that's, you know, that's a, it's a great brand uh, with a great product. Um, people saw, you know, oh, everyone's flocking to Subway. So I think I want a Subway. That's, you know, that, that's what I want to own, right? So they come to me and they say that and I say, okay, well, you do realize it takes, you know, quite a bit of sandwiches to sell, right? To five dollar sandwiches to make what it is you told me you wanted to make right and then I start pointing out things like the high overhead so you know food the food sector has a much higher overhead than something like cleaning um, because you've got all these employees that are um, that are part-time and you know they're you've got a building that you know is very elaborate it you know it has upkeep overhead leasing all of those things that a lot of other businesses don't have so the profit margins tend to be a little bit you know less than a lot of people expect in in fast food so so take that after I've explained that to them then I go to the other side and say and you do realize that if you have someone that a part-time employee that calls in sick you're gonna have to go behind the counter if you can't find you know and so people start saying and and oh by the way it's seven days a week right <laughs> so with long hours so once you start it really explaining to them it doesn't seem like such a great business investment it's not gonna fit in with your lifestyle um, so you know a lot of people are working in corporate America right now and what they're not looking for is to um, spend seven days a week necessarily you know out of the out of the out of home because they do a lot of that in the corporate world so they're looking for a little bit more work-life balance so you start to talk to them about what are your short-term goals long-term goals what are your fam you know what's your family time like you know what type of wealth are you building is this gonna be a I want to build it up and sell it and move to, move on to something else because I, I love starting businesses or is this a family legacy you know are you building this so that your kids can work there and you can pass it down to them so a lot of those so so again back to the original question which is you know why is uh, why 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 the most the highest performing franchise might not be a good idea for you it's because it may not fulfill what you're looking for in terms of owning a business and, and why you're even on the pursuit 
Wow. So that's the reason you are here, right? <laughs> it, it is. And, and, and also, I, I think, you know, you, part of your question was about, you know, we can do so much research on our own. Of course, these days, we absolutely can. There's so much on, uh, there's so much on Google and, uh, you know, other various um, platforms that you could, you could uh, look into. But the true, the true part is franchisors are not going to put everything out on the internet. So no matter what you're looking for, you're probably not going to have your, close to what the information I have. And because I have a personal relationship with these franchisors that I work with, I can pick up the phone and ask a question. I can do things that you may not get that same attention because you're one of a hundred people filling out an inquiry on, you know, on their website. So it, it's just, it's really beneficial to work with somebody that has, um, you know, their hands in the industry on a day-to-day -day basis. Absolutely, I, I concur. I concur and I support you and I see the value of working with the the um, the franchise uh, broker, right? Yes. Do you call yourself franchise broker or what? Well, usually consultant. And consultant. The reason, yeah, the reason for that is that we're not really brokering anything. We're really counseling people that are looking for um, looking for a new opportunity and we're counseling them and, and, and coaching them on the best way to go about it and making some recommendations. And interestingly enough, we're also, um, our, our job is also to make sure we're presenting um, qualified and and strong candidates to the franchisor. So we're also, um, you know, consulting with the franchisor to make sure we understand exactly what makes a good owner in their particular brand. So it's really more of a consult consultative relationship than a broker. Mm -hmm. So how long is the process from evaluating a franchise to officially owning a franchise if my credit score is good if i have like 20 if i have 30 percent down payment so mm -hmm. what what would be that duration Sure. So, um, you know, someone coming to me is kind of the first step in the process. And then we spend, you know, a couple of days. It's, it's you know, it, it could be quick. If I've got people come to me and say, I know my personality. I, yeah, I've been looking into this particular sector and, and I want recommendations for it. It can be relatively quick when I can get them into an introduction with the franchise or to start having the, the, the conversations to move to the next steps. Um, so, the, so the short answer is uh, legally, um, um, uh, which is uh, mandated by the Federal Trade Commission, which franchises are under, um, the, uh, a candidate must possess in their hand the franchise disclosure document, which is sort of the Bible of the, of the um, brand. You must have it for 14 days legally. So um, if you've spoken to a franchise or you both think it's a great fit, they're going to email you out a copy of the of the FDD, the disclosure document, and they're gonna ask for a signature, an electronic signature, acknowledging that you've received it. And, and from that point on, 14 days later, you could actually sign an agreement and be an owner of a franchise. So that's the quickest. I would say that most people um, are on a 60 to 90 day cycle, and they're on a 60 to 90 day cycle if they are really interested and have done some homework. So I think the stat says that uh, people consider buying a business at least three times before they actually make a move and that could be you know once you know that could be three years it could be three times in a year it depends um, but that's kind of you know the statistic on that so if someone comes and they've done their homework and they really feel they're ready to go um, you know we will start getting them into an introduction with the franchise or uh, within the first week or so and, and have them talk through that the second step uh, again after receiving the franchise disclosure document is um, doing what we call validation so validation is what you're going to do when you uh, when the franchisor gives you a list of current franchisee owners of the brand. And you're going to want to reach out to those franchisee owners and talk to them about their business. Any questions you can think of, and I certainly have tools that I can help, um, you know, with my clients that need a list of questions or want some guidance on that. But you really are going to want to um, feel comfortable that you've made enough of those validation calls that you understand the business and what, what is expected. So that's kind of the next step in the process. And then, you know, we have intermittent calls again with the franchise or if it's a brick and mortar, you're going to be having real estate conversations, you know, leasing conversations, where's the best place to be. So all of that is happening. And then what we call close to the final step and before signing agreement is uh, we do recommend uh, having a discovery day. 
at the headquarters um, of the franchisor. And that allows you to really experience the operational team firsthand. Um, a lot of people make their decision after that meeting because they'll see the headquarters, they'll, they'll connect with the team and they'll just walk out in there and say, I, this is, feels like the right place for me to be. And so it's a very important step if you can do it. They've been doing a lot more. Right now they're doing them virtually, of course, um, but, but some franchisors have moved to virtual uh, just for you know, affordability and those sorts of things. But those are kind of the steps. Um, and again, depending on how much you're borrowing from the SBA, if it's uh, less than 120,000, that's kind of their fast track program. Um, they, can, they can approve a loan in 14 days for that it's pretty quick but anything over that it could take you know six six weeks or you know that sort of thing and keep in mind for a brick and mortar the SBA loan is not actually final until you've actually signed the lease so the approval of that is contingent on your ability to actually find a location and that it's within the cost structure that you put together when you applied for your loan so it's important for SBA to marry those two those two things up What's the range for the cost of a franchise? So I wish I had an easy answer for you on that, but I really, really don't. So I can tell you that um, on the lower end of the scale are going to be more of the cons consultative franchises. Mm -hmm. So things like travel agent is going to be, you know, somewhere between, you know, it's usually around 10,000 and they'll finance 50% of that. If that's, you know, if you're, you know, if that's where you're headed with that, but there's coaching programs that are um, in the mid, you know, 20, 25 range. There's property management that tends to be, um, you know, more on the uh, affordable side. And then when you're getting into 50, you know, 75, you're looking at, you're starting to look at senior care opportunities there. You've also got um, children's education. There are some, some less expensive, but children's education, tutoring, um, STEM, STEAM, specialty, you know, uh, classes, music, cooking, those sorts of things you'll, um, because you'll need a facility. So you'll see that. And then, um, you know, 100,000, you know, up, you're, look, you're starting to look at more of the brick and mortar locations. Um, but, you know, commercial cleaning, you can get into, you know, great businesses under 100,000. But, you know, everything goes all the way up to the millions, of course, when we're talking McDonald's or those sorts of, uh, those sorts of brands, tier one brands. Mm -hmm. So let's say, the, yeah, um, a million dollar, let's say for McDonald's, to open a McDonald's franchise, that is the cost of getting a franchise, not the, the location is not yes. included, correct? That is correct. That is correct. So um, I believe that most McDonald's, um, they require that you, ha you own the land. So it's, not in the situ it's, so it's not in the situation where someone can be removed, right? So what, you, well, so what a McDonald's would not want to happen is that a landlord go, and, and actually we've seen some of those cases with older owners um, that, that did initially, you know, lease their, um, you know, there's a commercial lease, have a commercial lease, and they were surprised because the, you know, the landlord decided they wanted three times the rent and they were unable to, to deliver on that. So they would either have to find a new location or they'd have to shutter the doors. So in, in, in most instances, um, you know, McDonald's is looking for someone that can afford to, um, you know, either lease to own or have some type of commercial um, ownership over that, that, over that property or that space so that there's no, you know, battling about raising it or, or when the lease is up, you have to leave because I have someone else here. So that's usually the case, but on, on a smaller note um a lot of you know a lot of branches um a lot of different businesses they will help you negotiate a seven to ten year lease it might be a clothing store you know resale resale of clothing um you know uh um, a batteries plus is another example of where you could, you know, um, lease the land. It's more of a warehouse type um, space, but there are again, similar to restaurants, there are um, other uh, sectors such as um, office space rental. So shared workspace, that's absolutely, you must own that land and, um, you know, figure out, well, I shouldn't say absolutely, but, uh, but there are brands that require that you purchase the land. Um, others will work with you and for long to, 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 
solidify long-term leases because again we don't want to be kicking people out of their business offices you know in the middle of that so there are those and and salon suites so you know um hair salon stylists they have suites uh, shared office space or share suite space um, those are others that you know um, that work really well for people that have access and own commercial land mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand that. I, I watched the uh, movie about uh, McDonald, mm -hmm. and they they said that their business is not a burger. Their business is right. real estate. Is the real estate, correct. Right. And now I understand why. Yeah, um, yeah because they don't want, um, they don't want, the, you know, the franchise or have to be, you know to move right because it's, right. it's they, the the business tied into a location and they did a lot of research about where where is the best place to have a mcdonald that's correct so it's that's really correct. really really good and that's the reason that you pay high price for a well-known franchise because they did all of those research, right? They are, they are. Yeah. And, and, the, and the brand is very strong, it's recognizable. People feel that while it's a larger investment, it's less risky. And in some cases it is, but you know, let's just say most people walking around, they cannot afford a McDonald's or a Burger King. So, um, you know, you can work your way up to it, but I tell clients that all the time, just because you come to me and you have a brand that you really love, you know, maybe start off a little bit smaller. Start off in something that's you know similar to it and, and learn about it. And uh, Because let me tell you, once you have a business that's successful, you're gonna have a lot easier time asking the bank for more money, right? To, to either expand that business or buy something else. You have you know proof of concept. You've shown that you are a good business owner and that you're diligent. And, and again, I love franchises for that very reason because they have built themselves so that they are scalable. And if you would like to grow and grow into an empire and, and, and multiple locations, they make it a lot easier for you to do. Mm -hmm. So how, um, who is your competitor and why working with you is a better choice? Yeah, so in my business, I, I, you know, others may see um, competition. I don't really see that. I, for me, and and it's probably not the best to um, to to compare it to real estate agent, but because there, I know obviously there's a lot of competition there, but it's similar in the fact that you really want to find someone that you connect with and work well with, and you think has your best interests at heart. So finding that person is going to make you feel much more confident about the process and that the person is on your side and not just trying to gain a commission off of, um, you know, selling you just any franchise. So I think it's important to, you know, interview a couple of people or, you know, look for people that maybe have something in common with you. And, and as we talked about earlier, uh, that's why I got into this business. I wanted to be able to have other um, African Americans and women and women of color see me doing this and 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 understand that you can become very well educated and it, it's less of a risk the more that you know you have someone that's going to be here that you can ask questions to or if you're in a panic or something that you may not know you should be asking for um, that's why I'm, I'm here to help you and and mm -hmm and be your ambassador. So I don't really see it as competition. I, you know, I've had clients that um, have been working with me and someone else and, and at times they've ended up going with the recommendation that I made and then other times they've decided to go with, you know, the other consultant. So I, I'm, and I'm okay with that. I, 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 wanna, I wanna work with people that, that feel a connection with me, feel that I'm there for their best interest, and that um, even after you know, they've purchased the business, that we'll still have an ongoing relationship. If they need something, they can call me, and I will continue to do what I can to assist them. Wow, so that relationship is still going on? Uh, yeah. after they they purchase their franchise? Yeah, so I would say it depends on the client. So I have clients that, you know, have owned several businesses. They really were just coming to me because they wanted to know about a specific brand they had seen and they wanted the kind of the inside scoop or they um, or they had a, a sector that they were interested in and, and wanted me to recommend a couple of brands and they've done it, been there, done that, purchased it in, in, a, couple, in a matter of a month and then sort of moved on and I'll reach out to them occasionally and, and and see how they're doing. Um, but there's other people that 
call me and say, you know, hey, what do you think about this? Or, um, you know, I, I'm actually, I had a client that bought a business and eight months later he said, I'm doing so good in this business, I'm ready for another one. So, um, you know, so, so it is, you should, you know, I do my best to keep an ongoing relationship with those that feel they're, you know, going to need something, but it is also beneficial for me because I can also find out from a, um, from a client, whether or not the, the franchisor is living up to what they said they were going to do. So if it's a situation where the franchisor is not delivering on the promises, um, I can help them. Uh, you know, get, get what they need. Um, but I can also make a mental note of that and say, you know, if this doesn't get better, there's no sense in me recommending this franchise. So having an ongoing relationship is, is helps all, all parties. Absolutely. So who pay you? How did you get paid? Yeah, that's important, right? Um, so so th that's the other thing about uh, franchise consulting that I love, particularly working with women and minorities. And I can tell you that in my community, we have a, you know, a, a, a tendency to fear um, government and fear um, organizations that we're not familiar or comfortable with or have never worked with before. So there's this, uh, there can be this underlining, you're out to get me, you're going to take my money attitude. And so um, one of the reasons I love franchise consulting is that our services are 100% free to our clients as it relates to, you know, helping them get into a franchise uh, that's going to work for them and their families. So the nice part about that is they don't feel they're paying some money to someone that's going to steal their money and just take off and not deliver a service. We are compensated by the franchise or if we are to place a client into a, a brand, we have a pre, you know, a, a uh, an agreement of a commission that will um, that will be a result of that placement, and so that's where the um, that's where the payment comes in. That's where the commission comes in, the, the compensation. Um, but I also like it because um, I represent over 500 different franchise brands across the U.S., Canada, and certainly internationally, depending on the brand where they're established today. So um, also, it gives my clients a um, a bit more confidence that I'm not just pushing five brands down their throat and they need to go to these five brands. We really can take the time to go through what they're looking for and the, uh, what they need and assessing that um, personality that they have to find the right one. We've got plenty to choose from. So, you know, it's not, I'm, I'm really not trying to put, you know, a, 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 a a square, you know, peg in a round hole. I really am looking for the right fit out of the various, you know, numerous brands that we so you say that you you work with uh, a little bit more than 500 brands across the United States and Canada and international? Yes, international. We've got a lot of brands that have presence in Mexico, um, uh, the Middle East, um, Africa. There's a lot of auto auto body, um, auto you know shops that are in a lot of those countries. But there's also some food brands as well that are you know uh, dispersed throughout. So yes, um, quite a quite a few um, over, you know, 100 and I believe 32 different sectors, um, you know, of those brands. And I would say that in, a, in the event, I think I mentioned it earlier, in the event that a client say they're driving down the street or they're seeing something on TV and they're like, hey, I really like that. Um, they can call me or send me an email and say, do you know anything about this brand? And if I don't represent the brand, I can always pick up the phone, figure out who to call. I've got a lot of a good network across franchising. And then I can interact with their franchise team and see, are they working with brokers? Are they open to working with brokers? And in the event that they are, we can sign an agreement and I'll do my introduction for my client and, and get that ball rolling. Um, in the event that they're not, I do instruct my client that, you know, I'm happy to help you. I'm just not going to dump you off, but you are really going to have to take the lead on going to and working directly with that brand. And I can certainly coach you through what that looks like. Mm. And that case, you your client, the, the client will pay you, right? Because you are, you're giving them support without yeah. the, the yes. franchise or Yes, it, it depends. It depends. So, you know, in that case, sometimes if the franchisor is, is a very experienced franchisor, they're not going to really need my services. So what you'll see a lot of times is what we call the tier one brand. So the McDonald's, they have 
full in-house, um, you know, departments that are constantly, you know, working on franchise, each franchisee and candidates needs. So it's, it's, you know, they're not, I don't know if I would charge. I typically don't charge for that because if, if a client even does call me after they're in the network with those uh, particular brands, they, they, it's rare that they're going to need something. Those brands have been doing it for a very long time. They've, they're, they're very professional at it. They usually will answer every question that you have. So normally I, I wouldn't charge anyone, but you know, if, if it's a whole nother project, there, there are things, cause people come to me with um, very sophisticated projects or things that they're looking for in the market. Um, it could be a resale, it could be a resale of multiple units, then that could be an opportunity for uh, me and for us to work out a fee, uh, fee structure for that. Mm -hmm. So what are the valid concerns that most people have before they purchase a franchise? So it's, well, I guess it would be the same thing that um, you are um, fearful of if you were to start your own business, right? So um, fear of failure is going to be the number one. And I, I, this, we spend a lot of time coaching on fear of failure because it is a little nerve wracking when you're thinking about going from a steady paycheck um, every two weeks and, and bonuses to, um, you know, making it happen on your own. So we spend a lot of time on trying to overcome that fear. And one of the things I do share with my clients is if you are, you know, 85 to 90% sure, that's probably as sure as you're going to get. <laughs> because most people are use that 10%, you know, 15% fear as a way to drive them to be successful. So it's very rare that someone comes to you and says, I'm 100% sure I have no more issues, no more worries. Um, but you know, to get to get that close is, is, is something that you know, you really should work on. So you know, so fear of failure, um, the cost, Am I going to be able to afford this, you know, and, and, and just delving into that. Um, I always really encourage people when they come to me and they say, I have $75,000 cash to put down. I really wouldn't recommend doing that. I mean, you should be saying to me, I have 50,000 in capital, right? Or, you know, make sure you're giving yourself enough wiggle room that you're not spending every penny that you have and don't have anything to fall back on. So being realistic about, you know, what it's going to cost, but you're leaving yourself with and, and the wiggle room that you need to, to make sure you have. Um, and, and then, you know, again, just goes back to the fear. Um, what if I do it and I don't like it? You know, that's people who are like, I thought I wanted that's a, a good one. Yes. Right? I thought I wanted a subway. I love their sandwiches and they're so friendly to me. And then I get in it and I'm like, oh, this is not what I thought. So, um, so again, but we have techniques to get people past that to either make a better decision in the beginning so that you don't hit that, um, hit that wall. Um, but also um, just the confidence that if you get into a business and it doesn't work, this is franchise, this is independent. It's not the end of the world that you will learn a lot, you will recover. Um, I remember speaking to a woman that owns a very successful um, uh, spa enterprise and she always said to herself, she was, re she was insur in insurance for a long time, making a lot of money. And you know, her husband would say, well, why don't you know, you really wanna start your business, why are you not starting it? And she's like, because if I lose the money, I will be homeless, you know? <laughs> and it's like, we always think of the worst case scenario, which, is usually not the case. So again, just getting people to understand that, you know, failure is a part of life. You can, you know, you cannot do so well. We can work on how to improve that. That's why I like franchises because in a franchise situation, um, whether people really believe it or not, the good franchisors, they want their franchisee network to succeed. It's really important to them because that's a fundamental part of their success. If they have franchisees that are failing, then new clients or candidates that are coming in, they're not going to be able to validate well. So you're never going to get additional, um, you know, owners onto your network. So that, that's one of the reasons that, you know, you're not in it alone. You've got the franchisor that, that has a stake in it. But the other thing is, as I mentioned earlier, they are um, registered with the FTC. They're also most, you know, most of them registered with the F SB, SBA. So in the F, if, so they have to file every year. 
uh, they have to file every year like a business and say, this is my franchise disclosure document. I have changed something. I have not. So there's a process that you have to register in certain states every year. And the FTC will look at that document that says, this is the number of doors we closed and this is the number of doors we opened. And they will, you know, that can red flag. And, and so there is a concern there and they don't want to be that franchise or that's getting flagged. And then on the SBA side, because they are registered with the SBA and a lot of owners do have SBA, SBA loans, if they have a situation where a lot of owners are failing and not paying back their SBA loans, that could get that franchise kicked off of the registry. So there are, you know, there are downsides or, you know, um, repercussions to um, franchisors not picking good candidates and not picking people that really want to succeed and are trying. And there's no benefit to not helping them when they're struggling and, and making sure that they're, um, you know, surviving because the, the, it's a symbiotic relationship everybody's in it together I feel great I feel great when you say these things because um, yeah well I think working with you is like working with a coach yeah but it's focused very focused very on focused. on yeah. on the business this kind of business yes right because yes fear failure uh, the cost um, what if I change my mind what if I cannot handle it and things like that. those are key key things um, that will stop us Correct. right from Correct. achieving our dreams Correct. and it's important to work with somebody who 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 are, who are trained in doing that right? right so in my line of work would be life coach a coach uh, who 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 have walked the past and who know what's best for you right Correct. <clears throat> and then in your line of work somebody like you who have experience and certified in working with with clients who are um <clears throat> you you give them um emotional support Right. right. Um, yeah. Yes, they can come to me and they can say, yeah, I, I want to buy a franchise, but I'm, you know, I, I'm afraid I'm going to fail. I don't know how to handle it. Yes, I might, might be able to help them reduce the fear failure or get rid of those. You know, right. we, we, we dig deep to get into the limiting beliefs and other beliefs that hold them back. Right. right? right. But, but um, yeah, I think working with you would just like get to the point. What are the fear that that people have when they start something new and big, like buying a franchise? Right. I think it's again. Um, you know, it's the. It's the coming to someone to say, I don't even really know where to start, right? So you always have to, you know, a lot of times when people think about just, you know, general business coaches or life coaches, um, they're, they're coming to you for something specific because they have a problem or they're, something's not working in their life. And a lot of times for me, it's the same thing. Come, someone will come to me and say, I want to own a business since I was small, but I have no, I, I don't have an idea and I don't have an original idea. So it's not like I'm going to go get a patent. You know, not everybody has that creative mind to, to create a new product or service. But then they also say, but even then, I don't even know where to start. So it's a starting point for people that specifically know that this is, you know, there's something in them that's that's driving them this way. It's also taking people that um, are in corporate, in corporate situations that say, I've spent all this time getting this um, getting this education and experience and I've sort of hit this level where I, th I think I can do it on my own um, but again I need someone to help me bring it together just like I have in the corporate world I call on finance to bring me this or I call on operations to bring me that so they, they understand how to piece that together but they need someone to help them you know know where to start and then the other thing I was going to mention specifically to women because we're talking about this is that you would be surprised at the number of women that I have had conversations with or coached that say, how do I convince my husband to let, you know, to do, to either let me do this. And I know that sounds a little bit, you know, on, the, but, or um, support me in doing this. Right. Because there's a difference there. There's a, you know, my husband will give me the money and say, go off and do it on my own, but I really would rather have him support me. I want him to, you know, um, you know, so, so it's, it's that, it's that conversation. And I think when I first started this, I was not because of how I was raised and very independent. I, that, that wasn't a question that I expected to get as often as I do, but it is something that you have to end up talking to 
more, you know, women clients than you would hope to, um, because it can be a very sensitive subject. Absolutely. That's, I think that's the number one, number one concern um, from a, a client, from, from, from people who are considering hiring a coach, right? But they always say, I don't know, you know, this kind of money, I don't know if my husband going to support me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, support me means like paying, agree for me to pay this amount of money to work with you to improve my life. Right. right. So right. Right. we have to like addressing that to say, yeah, you know, how often do you allow other people to make the decision for you about your life? Absolutely. And, but it's even, it's even more important in franchising because a lot of times a franchisor will require this, this, you know, the, the spouse to be a guarantor on there because it's obviously, you know, that relationship is going to be very intimate when it comes to any issues with the franchise or, or issues with the marital relationship that is going to negatively impact the franchise. So franchisors want to know that the husband and wife are on the same page, even if the spouse is not going to participate on a day-to-day -day basis, but there, there has to be a level of support for someone to do really well in, 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 in a franchise business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, what do you want people to do if they are interested to find out more about your service? Where should they go? Yeah, so I'm really excited about this. Um, I, you know, obviously you and I have connected and I'm so excited to partner with you. Um, folks can go to your website and under the sponsorship is uh, Invaluable Franchise Consulting, Nancy Williams. You can click on there, that'll launch you to my site. You can request a, a free consultation through that. Uh, you can also learn more about me and, and how I got to uh, be doing what I'm doing. I also write for a few magazines so you can access those articles there. Uh, so again, you know, excited to, to, to go that route. Um, you can also call or text 510-957-5901. And, uh, you know, let me know if you're interested in a consultation. Um, and uh, certainly if you text me, we can set up some time. I can send you my calendar link and we can do it whenever it's convenient for you. Thank you. And I have learned so much, so deep uh, from this uh, conversation, this interview. I learned much more about franchise, you know, owning a franchise. So I appreciate you for being here. And I'm also uh, appreciate you uh, to be our sponsor for the, the podcast, Asian Women of Power podcast. Absolutely. And, and again, I'm so excited to partner with you because I think we both feel the same way about empowering women to make sure they go after what they want. And as you say, speak up, stand up, and you certainly in business have to show up. And I did want to mention that if you, um, you know, in any way you contact us, if you let us know that you heard us through the Asian Women of Power uh, podcast, um, then we'll definitely send you our uh, top five list of pandemic proof franchises. I find that very interesting. We've been spending a lot of time over the last six weeks, uh, looking at the various franchises that have really um, come aboard and started to flourish during the time of the pandemic. And a lot of people are interested in learning about those businesses that are um, actually thriving and, and, uh, and are going to be transformed uh, after we come out of this. Yes, I highly, highly recommend you, the, our <laughs> listeners, to take that advantage the the Nancy's offering right now because she doesn't offer this all the time and if you mention right. about Asian women of power you heard her from the Asian women of power get in touch with her she will give you a special treat exactly. right exactly. and she will spend uh, more time with you to help you feel more confident uh, so that you can speak up show up and stand up powerfully and confidently. And I think the key for independence is to be able to do that, to be able to, to speak your own voice, speak the truth about what you want and what you stand for, right? Yeah, so, correct. yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy, for being here. Thank to you our, for having me. Yes. To our listeners, what is the number one thing that you will do to claim your independence? Please don't forget to subscribe to the Asian Women of Power podcast and the Asian Women of Power YouTube channel. Until next time, live life 
Lao. Goodbye now. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Asian Women of Power podcast. We encourage you to apply what you've learned here today to make your life a little bit better every day. For more tips, tools, practical ideas, and conversations around a business, life, and relationships so that you too can live life loud, we invite you to join the Asian Women of Power Facebook group at www.joinasianwomenofpower.com.